My name is Erin Young. I'm a visiting researcher with MediaRex. Um, I'm actually studying for my PhD at Oxford University. Uh, I'm in the education department and my topic is how interdisciplinary teams build new technologies. Uh, I've been working with MediaRex for the last year um, and I've been delighted to be asked to moderate this panel. Um, I hope you're having a great day so far. Uh, we're still waiting for the third panelist, but um, Maria will speak last. So if you don't mind, we'll go ahead um, and then she'll uh, come after. Um, so this panel uh, is named Personalities for Socially Interactive Bots. Uh, we're going to hear three talks, uh, followed by which I will ask a few questions of my own. And then if we have time, we'll open it up to the floor for your questions. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Devar Ardalan. Devar has been a journalist in public media for 25 years, and most of those were spent at NPR News. In 2015, her last position at NPR was senior producer of the Identity and Culture Unit. Uh, Devar went on to create iVal, whose intent is to fuse AI with cultural storytelling to help diminish bias and train AI, AI software to be more inclusive. Um, second, we'll hear from Omar, and I will get your surname right, <laughs> Omar Abdel Wahid. Uh, Omar is the head of studio at SoftBank Robotics America, where he is responsible for leading strategic direction and development for robotics applications in America and the overall user experience globally. Omar has over 20 years experience as an engineer working for large video game publishers, startups and retailers, including Ubisoft and Best Buy. Uh, previously, Omar was VP of engineering at Mighty Play, a game developer in San Francisco and he has also founded the independent games developer, Agent Disco. Um, and then last, uh, the panelist who has just arrived, I can see now, uh, Maria Lin. Uh, Maria was the lead writer behind Siri, overseeing personality and voice internationally. She currently consults as character designer, character designer for Sophia of Hansen Robotics. She writes on the topic of AI writing in her column, Artificial Intelligentsia, in the Paris Review. And over the past 15 years, her writing has appeared in publications such as New York Magazine and the Huffington Post. So without further ado, we'll get started with Devar, your presentation, please. Um, so at iVal, we are a cultural storytelling platform uh, powered by artificial intelligence. Um, at our heart, as uh, a species, we are storytellers. And so obviously, it's important for us to want to discuss the future implications of artificial intelligence and automated storytelling, especially when it comes to the cultural implications, right? Um, the logos that you see on the bottom are all the places that I've done global storytelling at. So I've worked on global storytelling at NASA, USAID, the World Bank, um, the Australian Aid Program, and at NPR News. Uh, the problem today is that artificial intelligence is shaping the future of storytelling and automated stories. However, these tools, as we know, are missing global voices and cultural data, leaving large portions of our planet's population excluded from future stories and narratives. So last year, the Washington Post had 850 stories that were produced through uh, their machine learning apparatus. And that is very promising for those of us who love the future Telling. Uh, but when you look at metadata that's lacking around uh, different cultures and traditions, that's when we know that once we try to get beyond telling stories of sports, weather, politics, and business, that we're going to need to have uh, more focused data. There's, always, there's also a huge demand for this, so the market validation of having uh, you know, more localized uh, and content that is uh, customized is big. Uh, what I love is this statistic uh, from DigitLab that 48% of millennials are open to receiving recommendations or advice from chatbots, which means that we as producers are in a great uh, position to create productions for chatbots, and we should be doing them and thinking about doing them multiculturally. So our solutions are introducing global narratives into AI and Internet of Things with multiple applications and revenue streams. So we currently, on the Google Home, have a storytelling bot. Uh, it's the iVow Assistant. And also, um, our prototype on storytelling app is all based on uh, Hispanic American traditions. So we are working with um, the ethnographer Miguel Gandert, who has spent his life's work uh, documenting the American Southwest, and he has gifted all of his uh, data to us. These are images and content uh, of remarkable uh, Indo-Hispanic traditions of the American Southwest, and that's what has been fueling our deep learning of our machine. Um, 
Going back to what the problem is, this is the uh, Amazon Image Recognition API, and if you put in a picture of St. Patrick's Day Parade, you will know with 99.1% accuracy that there's a kilt in this uh, photo and there's a bagpipe. You can also tell that this is a St. Patrick's Day Parade um, if you put in through the uh, a uh, Amazon Comprehend API. But if you put in a picture of a New Mexico Indo-Hispanic tradition, the API is very confused. This is a Native American headdress, and this, uh, we are told that this is 58.9% probably a female. Uh, this is exactly what the problem is. There are not enough cultural information that are tagged in new and informative ways. Uh, this is what we're bringing to the table. We are adding cultural uh, tagging of data and um, really being purposeful in understanding, working with different communities. Uh, our biggest partners are Morgan State University, which is a 150-year-old historically black college and university, SIPI, the Southwest International Polytech Institute, uh, Native American, one of the premier technology institutions there, and also um, the... Uh, folks at University of New Mexico through Professor Miguel Gandert. Um, if you look at this image uh, here on the left, it's from February 2008 in that Amazon uh, recognition app. And then to the right is the IVAL cultural engine and through uh, NLP and machine learning, being able to generate sentences regarding this uh, festival in Zacatecas, Mexico, which is a very profound uh, tradition um, in the, uh, for many actually Hispanic Americans here also in this country who um, have many cultural ties to obviously Mexico and different parts of Latin America. Um, so our app is a snap and match. So in the future, imagine a uh, Shazam of culture where you're in um, a district in Los Angeles and there's a mariachi band. Well, this is actually an incredible festival that happens yearly and you will be able to be matched to uh, different stories. Our journalists are writing stories that then um, give more information around the cultural events. You can explore other uh, cultures and um, through the beauty of machine learning, um, they're you know, learning and adapting, which means that in the future, machines will be a lot smarter and more culturally conscious regarding the stories from our communities. And regarding the chatbot, I'm just gonna play you a few examples here. So um, let's say that your daughter is working on an essay on American traditions and you're at an AI conference and you can't be there. So you can go to your, uh, your daughter can walk to the kitchen and go to the Google Home and ask for iVow to tell her a story from a Native American tradition. Yat eh. She eh chemisa edmo yenashia twirk oje nishle, black fi and shishoni benek brushachin. Ashihi dashache, black fi and shishoni benek dashinella. In English, my name is Chemisa Edmo. My maternal clan is Saltwater. I am born from my father, who is black feet and shishoni benek. My maternal grandfather's clan is Salt, and my paternal grandfather was black feet and shishoni benek. This is how I'm known as a Navajo woman. I'm also an engineering student at SIPI, and I'm very excited to build a cultural storytelling robot that is capable of communicating in complex and relevant ways. If we think outside the box, a robot like this would ensure our ability to bring our linguistic identities and unique legal histories with us into the future. And then you remember that your uh, teacher is actually from Hispanic tradition, and why not get some information for your notes for your essay? Hey the Google, bot. ask Ivao to tell a story from the Hispanic traditions. All right, getting the test version of Ival. My name is Cindy Quijosa, and I'm of Hispanic heritage. And one of the most significant traditions that we practice is the quinceanera. My mom had one, my grandmother had one, and honestly, at first, I didn't want one. But now that I think back about it, I'm really glad that I did that, because every aspect of it had meaning behind it. For example, the daughter-father dance, that signified the last dance before I was a grown woman. And so you get the idea. I also have one from John Smith uh, talking about his Irish immigrant uh, and you know lives as uh, farmers in Ohio. Um, the general idea is that there is a rich uh, possibilities for stories like this 
to cut across many different industries. They don't have to just be in the realm of journalism. Because corporations, uh, you know, you guys are talking about better productivity. It's like, let's humanize artificial intelligence. Let's tell our stories to one another. So human resources doesn't have to just have a functionality of making sure you have your health care. It can also make sure that your colleagues know your traditions and the commonalities that you bring as humans so that we can actually become more human together. Um, our team is journalists and technologists. Ben Kramer is here. He was formerly an Open Innovation Fellow at BuzzFeed, and we have done global stories together in the last two years in Tanzania, Timor-Leste, Tonga, and Fiji. So um, I'm excited for the next part of the, the presentation to hear more from Omar. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, I sort of just want to relegate my time <laughs> back to you. That was actually very interesting and fascinating. Uh, hopefully, this is almost as interesting and fascinating. Um, so my name is Omar. I'm from uh, SoftBank Robotics. Uh, we make a robot that you may be familiar with named Pepper. Um, this is me and Pepper. Um, I run uh, the studio, which uh, is both engineering and design. Um, kind of an interesting team. I'm sure there's plenty of engineers and developers in the room. Uh, besides engineers like myself on the team, uh, I have linguists, because Pepper speaks 20 languages. I have animators. Um, I have uh, HRI, uh, human robotics uh, uh, interaction designers, um, as well as artists and, and et cetera. Um, Pepper is, tell you a little bit of the story of the, of the company. Uh, Pepper is a little bit older than four years old now. There are 15,000 Peppers in market around the world. It's the largest distributed social robot, um, as we call social robotics, which we'll probably talk about a little bit here today, uh, in the world. Uh, mostly those are in Japan, to be honest. It's a little over 10,000 in Japan, uh, where it was first launched. In the US, there's a couple hundred. And that our job uh, in our office in San Francisco is to get uh, Pepper distributed around the Americas. Uh, mostly, uh, Pepper works at hotels, uh, banks, retailers, uh, uh, airports. Uh, there's a pepper at Oakland Airport, um, uh, if you use that airport a lot. Um, I'm going to skip around. This is sort of a generic uh, presentation I use um, for, for different panel discussions. Um, this one is sort of important relative to the evolution of technology uh, that we'll be discussing today. You know, we're somewhere on the far end here. But at one point, things were very mechanical, industrial age. Um, we all, uh, those of us that are around my age, uh, learned to type at one point, might have taken a typing class. And then uh, later on, uh, fast forward some decades, uh, we learned swipes and pinches and left and right from our friends at, uh, at Apple and Google. And more lately, we've had sort of body dynamic kind of interfaces with, uh, if, you've, if you had a, a console like uh, the PlayStation or the Xbox, you might be familiar with the Kinect. And more recently, there's been VR devices. So where that's important for us, you know, the next step as we see it is the technology starts to sort of disappear, right? No longer do we learn how to communicate to the technology, the technology starts to learn how to communicate to us. And so why, why is that important? I'll get to this in a second. So our belief in SoftBank Robotics is as we look at creating characters like Pepper that sort of mimic the way we look and the way we talk, uh, Pepper emotes with her hands and her eyes. She doesn't pick up anything, but she'll say, I have something for you. And she'll emote that way. And her eyes will affect blinking as well as colors around emotion. We believe that creates a relatable experience. So uh, as an example, and this is more of an anecdote of my own, I don't have long conversations with Siri. No offense to Siri. No offense to anyone that's worked with Siri. I ask Siri a question, I get an answer. If I ask the same question, I get the same answer. And, and that's purposeful and that's meaningful in of itself. We're creating a character that you may have a longer discussion with. You walk into a retail store and you say, hey, I need a shirt. Oh, what kind of shirt do you need? Well, I was thinking t-shirts. Uh, what size are you? And like the kind of conversation we would all have. You could do that with bots as well. You could do that with other entities as well. But the sort of human form that we've created, this character named Pepper, who has a background and a story, it has more 
of a relatable experience and we find that people are willing to engage more with Pepper. So how does Pepper do that? Um, we create things that we call intent engines. Um, not that exceptional of a, of a term, it's been used before. Intent engines are discrete systems that try to understand what you're doing. So everybody probably knows what speech recognition is, trying to understand the words that you're saying. Um, NLP or NLU is more about the meanings of sentences of those words. We have uh, most recently put face recognition in Pepper, which was a profound change for us. Pepper before that could see people, but pretty much had the same thing to say to everyone. I put face recognition, and that first time Pepper lit up, looked at me and said, hey, Omar, how are you doing? Was, was an amazing experience. And the next time I came around, Pepper remembered the previous experience, just like you and I would, because we now have auth and identity based on face. This, of course, will get into conversations we're going to have about data privacy and trust, et cetera. Um, object recognition, that's obvious. Gestures is a new thing we're working on. So we communicate with more than our voice, obviously. I've been waving my hands sort of dramatically here and there. You should be able to point at something. You should be able to go, you should be able to go like this. And Pepper will be able to do that um, a year or two from now. Don't quote me on that one. <laughs> this stuff's hard. Um, emotion recognition, Pepper basically can tell uh, if you're happy or sad. Uh, we're working on new versions of that to tell more concretely basic emotions so that she can decide that you're bored and change what she's saying or you're just so disinterested, disinterested she should speak to the next person next to you. So all these things are discrete engines. Any one of them doesn't have to be that accurate, to be honest, because when I sum up all of them, if I see one, if I see a person looking at me, holding an object, pointing to it, and saying, bottle, I should probably talk about that. If I see someone crossing their arms, not looking at me, so gaze detection, and you know, turned around, maybe I should move to the next person. So any one of those could fail a little bit, and, and we'd do this great. So let me speed up a little bit. Um, da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. All right, I'll leave it at this one. So um, what I'm hoping to do here today is get into, you know, as we see more of these in our lives, as well as virtual versions of it, as well as other pervasive technology, what does that mean for us? How do we stay inclusive of all people? How do we respect privacy, which is a bigger and bigger topic as we see in our society today and worldwide? Um, and how do we still benefit from this technology and, and still grow it so that it, it does the right thing for us? Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Maria Lin, and I have the odd title of an AI ghostwriter. Um, it was not something I thought I would ever have uh, growing up and um, as a writer for the, the last 15 or so years, but it's sort of what ended up happening. Um, I wanted to start off because this um, conference is, and this panel is about personality, or the conference is about trust, this panel is about personality. Um, as we're starting to see AI in every facet of our lives, from storytelling and news to social robots to assisting us in all these different venues, who do we want to be interacting with? Who are these personalities that we are going to trust and engage with? Because before we can get the engagement and build the right product, we need people to be willing to do it. Um, I, I love this quote on personality by Orson Welles because it's the kind of thing that when someone says it, you immediately, it has the opposite effect. You immediately kind of trust them. I have an unfortunate personality. Well, really, tell me more about that. And I think that's what trust is in a lot of ways. It's not always intuitive. Um, it will not always feel corporate or marketing or on message, but how do we create it for um, a product and a whole set of beings that's slightly in between human and fiction? Um, so I have written for um, and helped um, on the creative teams of Siri and Sophia. Um, Siri, as some of you may know, is um, what I call the OG AI, the AI that's been around the longest um, in terms of general populace interaction. Um, Siri gets about um, several billion requests a week from people all over the world, 40-some-odd um, languages and dialects. So for example, in Chinese, there's 
um, you know, Cantonese dialect in Hong Kong, and in mainland, there's Mandarin dialect in, in Taiwanese and Chinese. So there's a rich, rich um, body of language and interactions with people from every culture, from South America to Europe to, to um, the Middle East to Asia. And that, that was an in incredible experience to be part of that team, um, to really interact with the entire world and see things that were specific to the needs and interests of people um, in the US and you know, in, in, in Japan and, and versus Brazil, and things that were universal, things that no matter where someone came from, um, people were curious to know. Um, I went from there to, I was a creative director at Apple for six years at Siri for about three and a half, and then um, recently I've been consulting for Hanson Robotics, and um, as some of you may know, Sophia is a humanoid AI. Um, Everyone has different reactions to her, which is perfectly okay. Um, but she was the first AI to be granted um, human citizenship by Saudi Arabia, and also the first AI to be named a UN ambassador. Um, she's a UN ambassador of technology. And so with this amazing creative team as well, um, we're grappling with what does that mean? What does that look like? What is her role among people? Um, and a lot of that consideration from writing and crafting these personalities has been from that perspective. What is our role here, what are we doing here? So starting from a more um, fundamental philosophical perspective. Um, here's a little bit about my background. Um, I, so I've, I've sort of gone over the first two points. I also um, write for the Paris Review a column um, called Artificial Intelligentsia on different um, sort of thought pieces on um, the creative aspects of, of AI and personality writing. Um, I've been a general writer and editor for the past 15 years for various publications in creative um, writing and nonfiction. Um, I went to school at Swarthmore, which was an amazing liberal arts school, um, very foundational to the diverse background I feel like I, you know, I, I bring when I sit down to write a character, um, and also have attended graduate school. And, I, and I'm very interested in languages. I have varying proficiencies in the languages listed below. Um, definitely not fluent in all of them, um, but especially ASL and LAMP. Um, my son has special needs and is nonverbal, so that was something I also didn't expect um, to happen starting off as a writer 20 years ago. But it's gotten me very interested in communication, all the various ways we communicate. Um, ASL is American Sign Language, which I know minimally um, from communicating with my son. And LAMP is an amazing program on the iPad that actually allows children who are nonverbal to use gestures and um, there's sort of this pattern of language behind it. Um, so all of that leads me to my next slide, which is, well, here's some more interesting information um, about me just as a person. Um, I was born in Taipei. I lived um, on the East Coast, and I've, I've lived in different cities. Um, I loved writing and art when I was little, um, both of them. I, I love the act of creating things. And so I remember once when I was young, um, I made like a restaurant named Golgi's for my brother. It had one customer, my, my little brother. Um, the mascot was a hippopotamus, and there were like three things on the menu. But those were the kind of things I loved doing when I was young, sort of creating experiences, creating things from nothing. Um, I did also want to be a spy at one point, so my, my goals weren't always to be a writer or a creator. I also really was interested in espionage. Um, Classical music really stresses me out sometimes. I don't know if, <laughs> you know, I, I like to listen to it to, you know, to write sometimes, but then, you know, you get to a point where suddenly it's like, -na -na -na, with all the violins, and it's, it's you know, I've had to change my, my music selection. Um, I'm really terrible at following people in movies, so if you ever watch a movie with me, I'm the person who says, wait, is that the guy from the first scene who's the brother of the, and then, you know, I'm, it's pretty irritating, which would probably not make me a good spy, so it's probably good I didn't go into espionage. Um, and right now, I'm currently obsessed with um, warabimochi, which is this Japanese little dessert that's sort of part mochi, part jelly, um, and Snoopy Pop, which is, I can't stop playing this game. Um, so that's a little bit more about me. And what I sort of was trying to show is that this slide was my credentials. It was sort of my function. And this slide was a little bit more my personality. And what I'm sort of trying to say, and, and hopefully it came across, is that they're both really important in designing an AI and in a human interaction and a human relationship. Um, function in an AI is basically competence. It's that it works, that it understands, and it does the tasks that it's been asked to do. Um, and the effect is that there's substance, right? Like, this thing works. If you feel like, my background means that you trust what I have to say. Um, but the second piece of it is personality, and that's the likability piece. Um, it's just random non sequiturs, like I wanted to be a spy or that I play Snoopy Pop late into the night. 
very often. Um, and that's, um, in AI, that's likability, and the effect you get is flavor. And you need both substance and flavor when you are designing AI, especially at the rate AI is growing and at the, you know, the huge, um, the onslaught we have of, of how quickly this technology is growing. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of people focus on the function or, you know, there hasn't been as much work in the personality piece of it. Um, Byron Reeves, Jeff Hancock, and Sunny Liu in the Stanford Department of Communication. And, and Sunny presented on a panel I was with, um, I was on with uh, a couple months ago, um, did some research on social robots. And they presented um, about several hundred images of social robots to people and asked them to rate them on things like competent, how competent is this robot? How much do you like this robot? How warm is this robot? And um, what was interesting is that people had opinions just on a visual um, look, not on even interacting with them. And so the, the, the point here is that the likability piece is important. People are gonna have that perception no matter what, even if you don't think that they do. And even if you, if you think, you know, we just need something that works, people are going to impose that personality onto the robot no matter what. So we need both to establish trust. And I think the relationship between the two of them is where it gets interesting. So if this, so if the blue is function and the orange is personality, some people, you know, overdo one, or they might overdo the other, and if it doesn't work, that's not very effective. Um, they could be very far apart, so you have something that works here, but it tells random jokes about something else, and they don't feel connected. Um, they might overlap way too much, where it's very expected, you know, a, a finance AI is going to know a ton about money and be obsessed with money and make jokes about money. That's okay. But I think where it's much more interesting is where there's this sort of healthy overlap, because that's what, how people are, right? Like, I wanted to be a spy, but I'm a writer working robots. I didn't have that perfect linear, you know, story where some people have. Like, when I was two, I was watching Star Wars and building, you know, not everything happens in a linear way, and I think that's when the trust is developed, because the story feels more authentic, it doesn't feel perfect. Um, and obviously this looks different, you know, because I know that diversity is a huge part of this topic today. It's going to look different for different cultures and different, um, you know, backgrounds. Um, and sometimes that personality might look orange or purple or green or, or different, differently. But we do need diverse people in these fields designing for that. Um, so I'll just go very quickly because we're out of time. But we, these are some of the things we've talked about already. There's ways to establish personality. Um, you know, that Omar has touched on, like voice, speech, appearance, facial expressions, gestures, lights and sounds. Um, writing should take into account all of those cues. So the same script isn't gonna exist for, you know, an AI like Siri without a face versus an AI like uh, Sophia that does have a face and expressions. The script should not look the same. Um, and then how do you develop a likable personality? This is just a beginning. Um, but we need diverse perspectives. We need consistent diction to have trust. We need unexpected quirks. We need humor from backstory. Um, and we need a mission of fallibility. We need weaknesses. We need relatability. Um, and anyway, this is just an exciting topic, exciting to be here, and just the beginning of, of many great conversations, I think. So I'd just like to ask a couple of questions based on what we had. Um, so picking up on the uh, likability of the AI that you were just discussing, um, I wondered how might we go about developing uh, trustworthy AIs, uh, particularly taking into consideration a diversity of perspectives of people globally um, and ensuring inclusiveness for everyone so to the panel <laughs> well I mean I think that there is zero trust right now in certain communities of color they don't see themselves in anything that technology is creating and in fact what happens is they're you know the products are built and then years later Technologists pause and they're like, oh, okay, let's find a fix for that, which is what one of the professors said, that not everything is a technological tweak. So I think that you know, the foundations for artificial intelligence, um, culture, personalities is now. You guys are the gatekeepers. This is happening now. We can pause and make sure that cultures of the world and different diverse people are represented in new ways and that the people behind the scenes who are producing them are from different backgrounds? Uh, I would say, uh, and it's more on a technology side, uh, uh, it should all, tech, AI in particular, machine learning, 
should be transparent and should be accessible and it should be open to everybody, which sounds very, you know, like wide and, and uh, you know, maybe uh, aspirational. But, you know, a lot of the standard uh, blockers is simple access to technology. We, we should all realize that, right? Um, and then the understanding of what's going on. So when we're, we're seeing a lack of trust across the board is I don't know what big technology technology giants are doing with my data and our data. Like, it's not obvious at all. And even if you read the wall of text when you, when you first sign in, it, you, you have zero idea. You know, I would advocate, and if I get one message across here today, if I would advocate that, you know, the next major AI character should be completely open source and we build it together, and then there should be an education platform to teach you what's going on inside of it. And then possibly built off of that is some sort of amount of uh, advocacy for users. So this is your AI. This isn't, this isn't my branded AI for my company that you know, wants to sell you stuff. This is your AI that hopefully is your best friend you know, and grows with you and you can trust through understanding like you would trust people normally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I think, I think everything that's been said is very important. Um, you know, AI, machine learning is all based on data. And so if the data is skewed, the results that you get and the conclusions you draw are going to be essentially skewed. So I think it's important to make sure that our AI are engaging with every type of community, with every audience, so that we're getting a comprehensive set of information back. If one joke lands really well with, with this audience, but it doesn't with another, that's, that's data to take in. Um, but if you don't have a diverse audience interacting with it, you're never going to see that. Um, so I think diversity of people engaging with our AI is something that's critically important. Um, what communities are we going into? What, um, who are, our user studies are, are based on and the makeup of those groups? Um, I think another thing is that AI should care about the things that these diverse communities care about. Uh, content and knowledge base is a huge part of forming um, AI writing and, and content and you know knowledge base are based on domains and so there are certain things that are, are you know gender and racially and everything skewed in terms of the focus that AI cares about certain types of content um, you know for example is the AI going to know about sports scores recipes or a completely different kind of content that you know, by the way, has been overlooked because certain communities, you know, the things that they're interested in have not been taken into account. So I think content area is another place where we have a lot of influence and could bring uh, more diversity to the table. So I was interested, all three of you mentioned um, data and the importance of data in AI. Um, I wondered how uh, do you think we should design for data agency? So I'm particularly thinking about how could we effectively collect data from people while respecting their privacy, which is particularly uh, important in, in these days. So there's, there's no one standard way, as I understand, uh, to collect data, right? It's all, there's all sorts of crazy ways that people are collecting data for their machine learning um, from, you know, social apps and games, you know, the whole Cambridge Analytica stuff where people played uh, little survey games. Um, to things like um, 23andMe, you know, and, and Ancestry.com. People are actually giving their, this, this, by the way, this is my little, little bit, like, you are giving them your saliva. <laughs> and you're like, that's, I find that amazing. If you read actually their terms of service, which I did a little bit, then I got bored, but there, a report on that, they actually have supposedly licensed to your DNA Perpetually. I'm sure they have all good intentions, but I mean, so if we could also standardize how we collect data for machine learning in an open platform again, with probably some oversight, which, you know, I'm not a huge bu bureaucrat, but some amount of peer reviewed oversight in a standard way that we would do for other fields, that would help, and then have regular reporting out on that. Yeah, I mean, I really like that idea of having um, oversight and standards. Um, they don't have to be necessarily regulated, but having some sort of standards so that, uh, you know, do you remember when the internet first came out and everyone was afraid to put their credit card information yeah. on there and buy anything? Yeah. But then, you know, these badges started coming out, better business or safe, you know, and now, you know, there's been enough standard where, you know, it's more the exception if it's unsafe. 
But those kind of badges and, and you know, agencies or whether it's peer reviewed need to start happening for privacy and data so that if I go on this app and it has a, a red badge that's a one, I know that this is not gonna be a great site to interact with, even to read news. Um, I think recently, um, you know, a lot of major news, news sites, I think Huffington Post recently changed their standards and they, and they sort of, the language is also very innocuous. It says, oh, we are developing cookies and we're changing our terms so that we can better serve you the content that you want. But no one really bothers to read, you know, that. And in, in, a, in a day of impatience as well, you just want to get to that article that you wanted to read, so you accept it. Um, but what, what's happening is that even content is moving to a place of data collection, which is, you know, to me as having a background as a writer and journalist, that's, that's kind of alarming. Um, so I do think that some sort of um, standards to help educate the public would be a great place to go. And we have good, we have good uh, past track record for being able to do it successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Professor Harvey Mudd from Harvey Mudd College, um, I think it's Jeff Borkel, if I say his name correctly, has said that if you want um, AI to be inclusive, you have to invite the world to it. And so one way is through crowdsourcing. And, and I think Professor Evans might have talked about that. Um, crowdsourcing in an open algorithm setting, uh, this is something that Professor Hossein Rahnamad at MIT had talked about. You mentioned it, the idea of open algorithm, uh, open you know, crowdsourcing of voices. Uh, Mozilla Foundation has requested this summer in July, they need 10,000 voices to be able to train machine learning to, ha to understand different English accents. So I think crowdsourcing is a big one. Open algorithms um, you know, would be right there with it. Mm -hmm.